Are you saying you faked with me? Yeah. Now you're single. What do you know about sexual relations? Is it true that if you don't use it, you lose it? I'm a little worried about being a slut. You're listening to the Come With Us podcast. Talking the good, the kinky, and the ugly. Here are your hosts, Beth and Aaron. Hello, 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 all you sexy holes and holes out there. Do you geek out about sexy stuff like I do? I know our guest today absolutely does. Oh my goodness. We are so excited to have Susanna Weiss here with us today. Today, we're going to start by talking about lust languages, but we're also going to go ahead and talk about all sorts of like how that affects and how, how love languages, the language that you use around love and sex helps make a big impact in your love life. It improves it for everybody. So welcome to Come With Us Podcast, where we know that sexy stuff matters just as much as lovey-dovey stuff, and we want you to get all the pleasure that you deserve. I'm Beth Darling, author of, um, as I forget the name of my own book, but The Five Kinds of Intimacy. (laughs) Erin's laughing at me, how to keep your love alive. I know, it's, you know, I do this every time my brain's going three different different spiels going but anyway so if you haven't got my book the five kinds of intimacy how to make your love how to keep your love alive at amazon.com please do so or go to bethdarling.com and you can learn more and you can thank me later for making love easier so today i'm glad to be here with you aaron and Susanna weiss thank you thank you for showing up so early for us today let me tell you a little bit about Susanna before we get started, because she's pretty impressive. She is a Brown University grad with double major who has authored over 8,500 published articles. That's it, 8,500 published articles. She served as editors for editor for Teen Vogue, Vice, Complex. She's been a writer for Refinery21, Bustle. She's been a regular contributor to The Washington Post, New York Magazine, and so many more, obviously, 8,500 articles published. She's also a board certified sexologist, sex educator, and she's a birth doula. So you can find much more about her and all of her writings at SusannaWeiss.com. And we'll have that link for you in the show notes as well. But damn, Susanna, I am so impressed. I am. Thanks so much for making time for us. I don't know how you make time to do any of this stuff that you do, but I'm thrilled. And I know you have a lot to teach all of us. So welcome. Welcome to Come With Us podcast. Thank you. All right. Well, so Erin was the one who found, Erin, you want to tell them how you came and found about the love language, uh, lust languages? Yeah, not lust. We, we've talked about love languages forever ago. Uh, right. No, uh, a buddy of mine. So I've, I've Worked in radio for years. An old buddy of mine from radio found this, knew about the podcast, and sent it to me. He said, hey, uh, this was in the show prep I did this morning. Uh, take a look at it. I think it might be right up your alley for, for your podcast because I obviously can't talk too much about it on the air. Uh, FCC rules and all that stuff. So I read the article, and I liked it. And then I sent it to you, and I said, hey, we've done love languages. We've done five kinds of intimacy. Uh, There's four lust languages that uh, Susanna Weiss has written about and commented on. Uh, That's something we should probably dive into because, uh, I mean, our audience is predominantly male and, you know, lust, male, hand in hand kind of thing. (laughs) I love it. All right. So, Susanna, can you tell us what what are the lust languages and where did they come from? Yeah, so as I said, this isn't a real scientific concept. This is just a sex toy company that made some things up to get publicity. But um, (laughs) the lust languages are romantic, harmonious. Good to know, by the way. And primal, meaning uh, some people get turned on by feeling like their partner is, you know, wooing them and being romantic toward them. Some people really appreciate if the relationship is harmonious, meaning you know, people pitch in around the house and just make an effort to get along. Connected is more like wanting a deep intellectual conversation or to share your feelings. And that helps you feel in the mood because you feel safe and trusted. Um, And then primal is more like animalistic, kinky, physical based sexuality. So that's one that's one version of lust languages. I could also talk about erotic blueprints, which is sort of another way people are categorized sexually. Um, but I'll stop there. 
Oh no, I like that. So um, tell me about erotic, um, erotic blueprints. Can you give people yeah. an idea? That's a concept that's been around a little longer by um, the sexologist named Jaya. And she created, she's sort of surveyed people and seen they fall into five categories. Um, sexual, which is someone who's very into penetration, is not necessarily needing very much foreplay, just like has a high sex drive usually and wants partners to accept that. Um, sensual is someone who is more into like all the foreplay and all the even before the foreplay, like loves having a romantic setting and like giving each other massages and taking baths and stuff like that. Um, energetic is someone who finds sex to be spiritual and feels like maybe they could feel something without even being touched. And um, kinky is pretty self-explanatory, someone who's into BDSM or other kinks. And then there's shapeshifter, which is someone who may take on uh, the style of their partner or like be down to try out multiple styles. Okay, so with all of these sort of ideas and all of these categories and stuff, what is the normal, uh, quote normal, what does like a couple, what can they walk away with? What, what should they be thinking about when it comes to these, the lust languages, the erotic blueprints, how do they actually help people in a practical manner? Yeah, well, if you know, it's similar to love languages, if you know what turns your partner on, then you can learn about their lust language and then make an effort to make moves that will be received well by them. Um, some people assume their partner will enjoy the same things as them because, you know, do unto others. We think just treat people the way I would want to be treated, but maybe they want to be treated differently. So it's good to know you can actually um, take an erotic blueprint quiz i don't think you can take a lust language quiz but i think if you go to like eroticblueprint.com you could take a quiz and then like discuss your results with your partner um so then you each know like what will please each other the most okay interesting yeah because like uh i've read the the five love languages i mean i've been doing this show for two years now and read it in the past just because i'm nerd out on stuff like that um but it's interesting that like when I read it at first, it took uh, there was a couple of chapters that I had to read again. Like I read and I have to read things two or three times on each page usually. But there were a couple of chapters in the five long love languages that I had to reread. And I read it again. And the second time I went through it fully, I was like, oh, OK, so what I like doesn't mean that's what she likes. And I've got a freaking uh, like. It's very uh, technical the way I, I thought about it is, you know, in your car, you have an engine that runs the motor or that the motor runs. Then you have a transmission that actually makes it move. So my engine is different than the transmission because my transmission is what makes her move. So I had to rethink everything. But then the lust languages made sense because I read through all four of them and I was like, oh, yeah, that 100 percent makes sense. Why wouldn't there be like you have it for love and the actual like intimacy part of your of your life, you know, away from the sexual part, but the lust, the physical, like sexy fun part. Yeah. It makes sense that not, you know, there are that many categories that you have to figure out what your partner is, what you are, and then find a way to line those up and make sure that you're meeting each other's needs. So with the lust languages, Aaron, did you think that you could kind of put yourself in one of those categories? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, freaking hyper so i i fit in like all four depending on my my mood uh i know my wife fits in one specifically um mm. but like even from female friends i've had for years like that are, were married or have been married or whatever like almost probably 60 percent of the women I, i've talked to um like as a friend have all thought that they were about you know uh harmony like having talked to them now reading it all a lot of them shared the like harmonious aspect like where i would say you know hey i gotta get off work i gotta go do dishes make dinner and then start laundry and i had one friend of mine who was like holy shit like you'd be getting a blowjob a week maybe a day if you did that stuff and i was like Oops. okay first off i'm married so uh, thanks for sharing that information with me but uh but yeah like uh, probably 60 percent of the women i've i've known and been friends with it's a lot of 
I just want somebody to like share the load of chores at the house. And that just can, you know, turn me on in an instant. And my wife is the complete opposite. Now maybe it's my fault or not complete opposite, but my wife doesn't fall into that category. Maybe it's my fault because I started doing all these things. The second we started living together, uh, maybe I should have made her carry the load of chores for a while and then, you know, taught her appreciation for everything I do. But uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting that I feel like more women would fall in the first three categories Whereas more men would probably find themselves in the primal category. Not saying women wouldn't fall in the primal category, but just the way it actually, from my experience, the first three seem more of a female dominated type of thought process versus male. What do you, what do you think about that, Susanna? Like in terms of distinctions, I don't know, stereotypes, if you will, um, between men and male and females. I guess I wonder if that would be the case if women were already in relationships where chores were equally split. Like, I definitely think inequality in that regard can cause a low sex drive in women. And there's been research on that, that it does. Um, So I don't know if it's so much that women really get turned on by chores as it is that they get turned off by inequality. And maybe once that turn off is removed, then they feel more sexual. Not that your relationship is unequal. I don't know your relationship, but that's like a general finding that women tend to struggle with low desire if they have to like take care of the kids, take care of the chores, work, and then they just don't like have the energy for sex. So maybe mm-hmm. having a partner do more chores just helps remove that. Yeah, actually. So I I hadn't thought of it in terms of that, but I think that makes a lot of sense because if if you're feeling like you're doing, I don't think it's just a load. I think it's the load of stuff you don't want to do that you feel you have to do, not the stuff that you actually really enjoy. But, and I think that builds resentment. And I think resentment from anybody's standpoint does not add to turn on. It definitely, it's a, it's a libido killer, I think for men and women. And it also causes women to feel as if their partner is like another child of theirs, which isn't sexy. That's, I'm just saying what the findings say. Like I'm not trying to put right. men down. Yeah. Now, I mean, we do, I say, if we don't talk about what the stereotypes are, right? Because they're usually, there's, when it comes to research and stuff, there's generally some reason for it. And a lot of it is just, we've been brought up differently. So I understand we don't want it to be this way. And hopefully by talking about it, by recognizing where we are, I think that's our only chance to change things moving forward. So by no means are we trying to suggest that this is where people are stuck or anything, but rather that you look around and think about what applies to you and what can you do and, um, and talk to your partner about it. Cause I don't think it would occur to people to say, to think, Oh, wow. Maybe it really is the level of stress, uh, obligation in the relationship, not just about sex that then imp- impacts the sexy life. No, but I'm guessing that's applied to with like stress at work and everything like that. Fears of not being able to provide for your family that definitely decreases libido as well. So, yeah, I think so. Um, So that can play, I guess I think um, my take and my take on the five love languages and the same thing with kind of the erotic blueprints and, and the, these lost languages is, I always feel like they're a little um, superficial and that that really most of us want all of it. We just want different things at different times. Um, and that's why, so my book is about intimacy. I say love language is, you know, if I just am speaking Chinese really well and you understand it, but we're talking about the weather and the clouds and the airport schedules, right? There's no intimacy there. So yes, we can communicate, but it's not actually going to last. We can have a great 30 minute conversation, walk away and never think about it again. And that's kind of what I feel like about the lust languages is that if it's just about getting, getting naked with somebody and there's no, no substance to it, then I don't know that that's really going to be our best sexy. Do you have thoughts about that? Well, you sound like maybe someone whose lust language is connected. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I was thinking the whole time. Ah, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you, uh, we have friends that are in in the lifestyle community. There's not, some of them don't need that connection and stuff like that. You've, 
we've talked to them before, you know, during or off air or stuff like that about, you know, sometimes they're at a party and it's just like, oh, hey, there's somebody with a really hot ass. I'm going to go take care of that. And then that's the that's what they get. There is no connection there. It's just cool. That sounded like fun and it looked like fun. But then we know other people in the community who really need that connection. So it just depends, I guess, on where yeah, you're coming from and what you point. need. And yeah, every like I said, I'm kind of hyper where I'll hit all four romantic, harmony, harmonious, connected, primal, all that stuff. But there's a dominant, like one of them dominates the other three. And I think that goes for probably most people. Yeah, you want to be well-rounded. You want to be able to, you know, there's some times where, you know, you really want a romantic mood, a romantic setting, but is that dominating the the portion of your lust that drives you? Probably not, maybe, but depends on which one dominates your actual drive the most. What do you think, Susanna? <laughs> I think, I don't know, we should do some research because there isn't really studies on this, but I think, you know, the erotic blueprint has some surveys, not necessarily scientific studies, and they do find, you know, most people, they have one that dominates, even though they give you a percentage and you will have more than one that is high, but one will be the top one. Um, they also found that it's not different between men and women, which goes back to what you were saying, that actually women are as likely as men to say they're, um, actually don't quote me on this. I don't know if they're as likely, but not, not very different from men in whether they're kinky or sensual or something else. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm not really sure. I do think in terms of love languages, like I learned that mine is gifts, which was not something I expected. But since I knew that I started noticing, like, I really appreciate when people get me something because it really shows they've gone out of their way. And like, so I know more that I should ask for that. So I do think there's some like use to um, knowing what your top one is, even if mm -hmm. you have others as well. Okay. Yeah. So how do you think, or what advice do you have for people who might have like partners who might have very different um, lust languages? How do you, how would you suggest that they kind of help reconcile those to have the best sexy fun they can? I would say learn to explore a different side of yourself because you may get more turned on than you realize by your partner's less language. If you can find there's another concept I'll introduce called core erotic theme, which is like the, all your um, top sexual experiences and fantasies. So if you can somehow tie um, your partner's language to your erotic theme, so for instance, if your core erotic theme is that you like to feel like you are surrendering control and your partners, maybe your lust language is romantic and your partners is primal. Maybe you can experiment with, or that one's too easy because if, if it's primal, then you could be submissive and that's great. But okay, so let's say you're primal and your partners is romantic then you could experiment with, if you want to feel like you've lost control, you could experiment with having your partner plan a romantic evening for you and they're totally in control. So maybe if you learn other things about your sexuality, you can learn how to tie them to any um, less language so that you can create something and your partner can do the same. So you can create something that helps each of you explore a new side of yourselves and turns on the person whose less language you're um, accommodating. Okay. I really like that. Can you give us some other examples of what core erotic themes might be? Sure. So someone's core erotic theme may be um, that they get really turned on by feeling like they are one with the other person, which I guess it, yeah, it's maybe an energetic type feeling like um, spiritual transcendence. Some people may their theme may be that they love to it's sort of a feeling rather than a specific scenario so uh the feeling may be that you are feeling super desired or that you are doing something really taboo so if you look at all your fantasies and your um, peak sexual experiences, which is just a term for like the best sex you've had. Um, 
you can sort of look at what feeling did those evoke that may that they may have in common and that um, if you want to read more about this, you could read a book by Jack Morin. It's called, what was it called? The Erotic Mind. That explains it in detail. Mm, great. I love books. So, um, Okay, I like that. And I like that being wanted, uh, that that's a core erotic theme. Um, I think that's a really popular one. Is, is that correct? Do you see that a lot? That definitely is very popular. Um, yeah, I think I think people think of that as popular among women that we love to feel beautiful. Um, I think it's popular among men too that many men want to feel more desired. Um, yeah, and I hear that a lot from men who who are uh, concerned that their partner doesn't initiate sexy enough. Like that they, the reason that they want is because they, they want to know that their partner really does want them, not just will do it for them, but that they are lust worthy, I guess. Oh, okay. I mean, that's, it, it's really easy. <laughs> Cheap Trick said it best. I want you to want me. Mm -hmm. like that's, that, that, that song was written and it, it's kind of, you know, uh, just goofy for a lot of people and a lot of people think cheap cheap trick is is just kind of a joke at times but che like that song was written for a reason and there was something yeah. behind those lyrics i want you to want me i need you to need me I, I love you to love me like there's there's a lot of that in the human condition that that's what we crave that's what you know that's why we pair bond that's why people grow up and they they leave home and they go find somebody that they can actually mate with and you know try to build a, a long lasting relationship with that's what we all desire it's just you want to be wanted and that i mean yeah and as far as men wanting to be wanted i actually realized when we were talking about this because we did a couple episodes ago about uh writing your own like erotic fiction yeah. and i've written you know a few stories but we encouraged everybody like hey go just try to write even if you say i'm, I'm a shit writer i can't do it. just put your ideas put your fantasy down on paper if you put enough of those fantasies down on paper and you start looking at all of them, there's a common theme in your fantasies probably that, you know, surges out more than the others. That's probably going to lead you down, you know, what your core erotic theme is for you personally. So that's a good way to find it is, you know, write a one page story about, you know, having sexy fun or your, or your darkest fantasies or whatever like that. And just keep putting them out until you can isolate. Okay. This is probably the one that, speaks the most to me yeah that's true and then you probably get not only the core erotic theme but then also probably that lust language right how you want to to see that that core erotic theme exemplified or not personified but whatever brought to life yeah. if you will yeah okay well um so we're running out of time here so but but Susanna, you've agreed to stay with us and to talk on um, the next episode. And on the next episode, we're going to be talking about private language, like the codes that couples use and the way that they communicate in way that is just ways that are just specific to them. But but before we go, with respect to these lust languages and stuff, um, do you have any advice or anything else that you want to share before we, we let you go for today? I would say just to be open that you may be turned on by a lust language that isn't necessarily yours. So don't take this as like, you know, if you're this thing, then you always have to have sex this way. Um, it's just sort of a fun way to see, to think of different things you could try in the bedroom, but I would encourage people to try all of them and maybe try different forms of all of them and expand their erotic repertoire. Okay. Certainly, I think it's probably a lot easier than learning French or Chinese. So, yeah, we could all improve language skills there. So, all right. Well, terrific. Well, thank you so much, Susanna Weiss. You really are amazing. And um, again, if you'll tell people where they can find you, I know we put SusannaWeiss.com. That's your website. But on social media, how are you? How can they find you there? Oh. Um, yeah, Instagram is Weiss Susanna and Twitter is Susanna Weiss, um, S-U-Z-A-N-N-A-H-W-E-I-S-S. -S. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us for Come With Us podcast. I can't wait to see you next week. And 
everybody out there. And Aaron, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's so good to be here with y'all. And it's fun to talk about the bare naked truth about love, sex, and relationships. And, and of course, hey, y'all can get all sorts of more information from us. Find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, and if you haven't given us a review yet on Apple Podcasts, please give us a review so that other people can learn more and can join us on this. Uh, they can come with this podcast too. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Big hugs. And I'll see y'all soon. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Come With Us podcast. Be sure to follow us on social media at Come With Us podcast and send in your questions, comments, and confessions to come with us confessions at gmail.com. Until next time, keep it fun, flirty, and naughty.